uh, when I joined, I was um, a television producer. I mean, I, I joined as a trainee, but back in 1952. Um, and uh, so my job was to devise programs. Uh, and when it came to uh, production, I would direct cameras uh, in the studio. Uh, and then when we started making films, I directed films. But then um, as technology got better, uh, there were more people involved in the job. I mean, initially I made programs overseas with just myself and the camera, and I did the recording, uh, sound recording, that is. But um, later on, of course, you become part of a big team, so that if you look at Blue Planet 2, which was the last thing which I was involved in at all, uh, there are about 50 people involved. Um, and my job was limited entirely to the words. Um, I, I wrote the commentaries and spoke them. Um, but I, I would like to think that my um, happiest time was when I was uh, totally responsible for the production from every point of view and would sit in the cutting room, uh, as it was in those days, and, and edit it uh, in, in great detail. I suppose um, the first thing is whether you have a natural curiosity, whether you are actually interested in things. Uh, whether there's something that you really, really are interested in and, and you think about nothing to do with television. Uh, I mean, whether it was chess or whether it was uh, chimpanzees, uh, it's neither here nor there, that, that you're interested in, 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 in a continually in new things and new topics. Um, and then a, um, an ability, I think, to see a story, to see a narrative, um, to see a way in which the, you start talking about something and the viewer wants to know what's going to happen next. And that's an indefinable thing, it's very difficult. You can't teach that in a way, I mean, you either have it or you don't, I think. The speed at which things have changed, I mean, you, you, you barely learned how to deal with something before it's out of date. Um, and these days that is certainly the case. Um, and, and because new equipment is coming all the time, new abilities, new possibilities of getting pictures turning up all the time. I mean, what's the latest thing? Dr drones are the latest. How long thing have there been drones? Five years, seven, six years, something like that. But already drones are, oh, another drone shot, you know. And what's coming tomorrow? Uh, you, it, it, I, there can't be anything, no, that's a, too extravagant, but, but there can be few things that are, are changing more swiftly than video technology both not only in creating programmes, but in, in, in transmitting them and making them available. When I went into television, there was one television network in the whole of the United Kingdom, and you couldn't, couldn't see that from outside uh, London and Birmingham. Uh, and it was, uh, it, it all, came, all the shot programmes were live, except one or two tiny th things on film. Uh, and and uh, it was only on the air for a few hours a day. And when you went to get on the air, that was the only thing that television viewers could see. You were it, you know. And the, the situation between that, which was in the 50, 52, 53, and now 2015, 2018, you know, is huge. And what it's going to be like in another decade, I have no idea. I'm, one thing you can be quite sure, it's not going to be as it is now. I would say, if someone wanted to start, OK, get yourself a camera, home video, go and make something. If, if you're in the natural history game, make a programme about some simple animal, a mouse, uh, a worm, or a pigeon. It's something you can be sure is going to be there. And try and make a story about it and see whether you really want to spend your time lying on your stomach, waiting for the worm to come out of the hole, <laughs> or whatever it is. Um, and, and try and work out how you're going to tell a story about a worm. Actually, nobody's made a programme that I know about. I've, I've made, I've made programmes about worm sequences, but nobody's made the programme. It could be very interesting. You know, what happens? I mean, come to think of it now, what about lighting? Can worms see? Are they going to be put off by a light? How long will I have to wait before, is there a good time when I can expect the worms to come out? How do they copulate? You know, and how would I get the shot that would show it? Well, those are the kind of questions which you're going to have to answer and ask in reality, admittedly not with them, but I mean, if I'd asked them about a mouse, which perhaps is a more practical thing to do, that'd be quite interesting, you know. 
how do I know when the mouse is going to come out? How do I persuade it to come out? How do I adjust it to the light? What do I do about low light? What is the story that we're talking about? Uh, am I going to film it over a period of a day or a week or a fortnight or what? And if you start doing that and then starting putting it together, you'll begin to learn something about television and television storytelling. Well, the, the event and, and, and the, that I'm constantly being reminded of, of course, uh, which I can't, I'm not allowed to forget, um, was indeed a memorable one and, and one which I treasure, which was, which was an encounter uh, with guerrillas in Rwanda, and that was a long time ago. Um, and I get a lot of credit for it. People say, you know, how wonderful they all were. If they say that at all, the credit doesn't lie with me. I mean, the credit lies actually in that, with, with, with this extraordinary one, Diane Fossey, who habituated the guerrillas. I mean, we wouldn't have got within 100 yards of them, I mean, had she not done that work. And we had no idea that it was going to happen. Uh, and, and for that moment when I was, thought I was going to be talking to the camera about something that the guerrillas that were, that were 10 yards away, um, and when someone immediately came out of the bush next door to me and put a hand on my head, is unforgettable. So that would be, I uh, have to say, and if the, if the question is, what would you never forget? That's one. But there are lots of others, actually. Um, the first time I put on underwater gear uh, and dived um, on a coral reef was unforgettable. And that, again, is a natural history thing, but, but, the, but the beer business of, 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 of suddenly becoming weightless of suddenly being able to drift up in the air if you want to, or go down to, just with the flick of the fin, and that you're seeing, on, if you're on a coral reef for the first time, you're seeing a hundred different species, none of which you've ever seen before, all of which are breath, breathtakingly beautiful. You can't believe how extraordinary. Every one of which you say, what kind of creature is that? You know, that's got all those frilly vermilion stripes. Extraordinary. So that was it, but that, that's not, I mean, that's natural history that I'm talking about. That's talking about seeing the natural world, and those are the unforgettable things. When it comes to what, what stories you do, and, um, that's a different question. I don't know what I would say, um, except that uh, uh, putting cameras here, there, and everywhere and getting new shots. I mean, camera traps now, you see, they've absolutely transformed the business. The business of, of you being able to put in half a dozen cameras, small cameras, and at a place where you know that an animal's going to come. Um, I've not done much of that now. Um, it's, a, it's one of the later things in, in, in natural history filmmaking, and I can't pretend that I've, I'm expert at it. Uh, and so to, my ex to that extent, uh, what I, I do is, is to say, yes, I can do a story about that, and I would like to do a story about this is the way it would go, and this is the sequences that I think we would want. And then you argue with the director, if you're, <laughs> if you're, if you're um, uh, someone who appears in front of the camera. Uh, the boss should be the director, and, and I'm not a director anymore. Uh, and when I was, if, when I was a director, yeah, you, you paid attention to what the talent said, but if you are a director, you're the boss, you know. And you, <laughs> it doesn't matter what he does, you wait till I get in the cutting room, you know, or, or I'll, in the editing suite, as it now is. I, I, I'll put my stamp on it. We got, we got most things. You'll be surprised, and it's, I am surprised. Uh, these days, uh, natural history units and cameramen and directors are a pretty skilled lot. Uh, and it's a pity to say so, but it's but it's true that that actually the, the amount of money the production had got is is pretty critical. I mean, there was an episode in in uh, Blue Planet Two, uh, the, the annual mating of the of groupers up in in, in, in tropical seas, uh, in one particular uh, site where they assemble. They come from hundreds of miles away. These are big fish too. And they, and they come together and they spawn just at one particular moment, all of them, and suddenly it comes surging up. And they went, I wasn't there, but they went out uh, and did it, uh, or looked for it. They were told when it was, would happen, and then they were there in good time. Nothing happened. 
uh, and, and they went a long way. They'd gone to the other side of the world for this. And uh, the, the producers said, oh, well, next year, I suppose. And, and, and they did. And of course, it was a, a, a critical sequence and, and one that made your jaw sag, and it was worth the money. But it did cost money, and it costed a lot of, of uh, um, perspicacity and guts and so on from, from the people concerned. Which was not me. <laughs> I have I have ch have chums or had chums in this sort of game making natural history who absolutely love the tangle, the tinkle of of danger. You know, let's get a little close to that line. Yeah. I'm not <laughs> I'm not like that. You know, I'm I'm, I'm quite cautious. Um, and so, uh, you know, if I see in the animal that I'm getting near, I would see behaving in an uneasy way, I would, I would slowly walk backwards, you know, and, and get out of the way. Uh, and, and, but in, that, in a way, that's what this particular job, as I interpreted, that's what it's required. You aren't supposed to be making a programme about animals being frightened and aggressive. Uh, you're trying to make a programme about animals when they are at home and, and, and relaxed and doing what they would do in a natural way. I mean, I've been in I haven't really been in danger either, but I, I've been in circumstances when looking back at it, I thought you were pretty stupid. Um, I mean, I mean uh, back in the 50s, I mean, we set off, me and Charlie Lagos, my, my pal and my camera, uh, our cameraman, he and I set off for Indonesia. We didn't speak Indonesian, we didn't know where we were going, uh, there were, the, you couldn't make telephone calls, uh, there were no things like, uh, email or satellites or anything, you just were off and you were on your own. Um, and we did some silly things. I mean, looking back on it now, I think you're absolutely out of, out of your mind. Uh, you know, we wanted to, to get the first shots of, of an animal, which is now everybody sees it all the time, the Komodo dragon, biggest lizard in the world. And we just um, set off. <laughs> In, we, we couldn't, you couldn't get to the island directly because nobody, there were no outsiders living on the island. So we, we flew and took a tiny plane um, to an island called Flores, which was getting off 100 miles away. Uh, and um, when the plane landed, um, the Dutch pilot, it was pouring with rain, the Dutch pilot stuck his heels uh, into the grass strip on which the little plane has landed. And, said, and looked up at the skies that were drizzling. He said, well, I wouldn't want to stay here for three months. And I said, well, I don't know. <laughs> we're only going to be here for a week or something. He said, well, I don't know how you're going to get back. Uh, well, he said, why? He said, because I'm, I'm, I shall have to report by radio that this strip is now closed for the, for the rainy season. And we won't be opening again until the rain's finished. How are you going to get back? And I, <laughs> I said to, to Charlie, uh, well, we've got this far. It seems a pity to go back just like straight away. And he said, oh, yeah, we'll find a way back one way or another. No idea how I get back. I mean, absolutely balmy. And, and we got ourselves in a certain amount of trouble with gun runners and <laughs> pirates and whirlpools and so on. Nothing to do with television. And none of it would ever see. You could really, you had no idea watching the programmes in the end. <laughs> that, that was what went on. It just looked as though we were just sailed sailed off to the little island, uh, walk on, um, got a couple of coconuts, keep some drinks, and went up and filmed this dragon. And that's what it looked like. Um, but the fact that it was difficult uh, was of our own making, and nothing to do with the technique of television.